Okay to make it back? No, this afternoon. Okay. Yeah. I didn't think she was planning on being here. I didn't know Shelly was still uh, snowed in. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry, I cut the song off before the end there, but uh, glad, uh, glad you are here. Glad you are here. And uh, we will get us started here with Tracing Kane, session number two. And for those of you in-house, we don't have a printed outline today because the printer got jammed and the the unjammer is coming tomorrow morning. So, <laughs> so uh, there, there are uh, outlines available online for uh, those of you. But uh, uh, in the house, this is the first time in the house gets uh, sunk. Usually it's the online people that don't get something. But uh, this time it's the in the house people. Let me lead us in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're most grateful for a beautiful morning and uh, for wonderful people who join us here and, and online, live, online later on, uh, and just pray that the insight and the blessing would be an encouragement, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And with that, we come back to Tracing Cain. So last week, we talked about uh, the uh, possibility, and I'm going to go with it as, uh, as, as not definitive, because the text doesn't make it definitive, but as grammatically, I think more leans toward Cain and Abel being born in the garden than outside of the garden. The difference it makes is not so much for the life of Cain and Abel, and of course we're studying Cain and his descendants here. The difference it makes is long term on uh, the doctrine of total depravity and the doctrine of uh, original sin, which are cousins, and, uh, and, and uh, yet, uh, again, come, come down close, eh, where they were born isn't going to make a lot of difference on how we're going to interpret the story. Now, last week I gave, I waxed eloquent for a long time <laughs> about all the reasons textually that um, I think, hey, let's uh, at least consider them being born in the Garden of Eden. Well, John on the way out mentioned something, and that was that Eve was told as a part of the curse that your, the pain in childbirth is going to be multiplied. I am not good at multiplication tables, but I do know my zeros. <laughs> I know my zeros and my ones. And I'm half decent at the fives, as long as you don't get over six, uh, five times six. You know, I can, I can handle that. But uh, the zeros and the ones, I know them infinitely. Or whatever number you go, I'm going to be able to answer. So that is not a word. And I did look it up in the Hebrew, by the way. And uh, it is the idea of, of, uh, of, of exponents, of adding, uh, of, of multiplying to, not adding to, but multiplying to. So if your pain in childbirth is going to be multiplied, there had to be childbirth with some degree of pain to it. Uh, but I don't know, maybe it's a uh, stub toe rather than a birthing experience. I've never had a birthing experience personally, uh, but, but, uh, but I understand men can do that these days. I, I, I read this online. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, so I think that's just a, it's, a, it's another bit of evidence for uh, the issue that we've got uh, that um, 
see if I can get us here to the uh, right screen. I want to get to, look, I found us a map just in case we need it. Uh, I want to get us to, to the scripture here. And we've got uh, last week what we looked at, Adam knew his wife and she conceived. Well, I'm trying to decide how much uh, background to give you here. When you don't have an outline, you don't know if I don't go in order, right? And when you do have an outline, you know that I don't always go in order. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, what we've got here is we're going to talk about the murder of Abel today. It's obviously the most famous story of Cain. It's the one we got on the, on the graphic uh, of Cain killing his brother. I would say in most circles... One, in most circles, that story is known, and two, in most circles, that's all that's known about Cain. Uh, he killed his brother. That's it. And uh, you, if you, the advanced class would say, well, Cain married someone. Who did he marry? And, and, uh, and beyond that, nobody knows anything. So we are going to the doctoral level class here uh, in our study of Cain because you're going to know more than anybody on the world. How's that? It, you feel good. You need a certificate when it's done, right? Uh, so, I, I do want to point out: Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived. Now, I don't know that it has to be stated, but it doesn't tell us that for Cain. I think that's how it happened. I'm not trying to propose some sort of supernatural possibility here. But you get down here; she again bare his brother Abel. Not only Adam knew his wife, so you see, I don't know, the intimacy uh, that is pointed out here. And, and in fact, uh, I, I think that you would say even for the first baby that was born, although it, it might be more appropriate here than anywhere else, we don't typically talk about the relationship between the father and the mother when we say someone has been born. You know, uh, we just, uh, we just, we're, we're more like uh, down here, bear his brother Abel, that, you know, the baby was born. Oh, good. Uh, but here, it, it kind of goes out of its way to tell how this came. And then in the naming, she bare Cain. Did I mention last week? I don't think I did. Uh, did I mention what Cain means? It is, it is a form of the Hebrew word Cain, which is really how probably you would pronounce it if you were Hebrew is Cain rather than Cain. But it's this word right here, gotten, Cain. She named him Cain because I have Cain. I have gotten a man from the Lord. Now, I gave a few possibilities here last week, and uh, the one I kind of landed on, if uh, Cain was born in the Garden of Eden, then what she is saying is, hey, God, I know that this was a result of this right here, but this gotten, received, given, almost the idea of a gift, I know that you were intricately involved in it as well, that you are the one that made Cain, and I have gotten a man, talked about that last week, uh, from the Lord. Now, all of this is a little bit of a separation. I only had two kids, so, so I don't know exponentially how this goes. Uh, but I do think that uh, even my own two kids in our experience, the first one got a lot more attention than the second one. Sorry, Nathan. I mean, especially in the birth announcement, in the celebrations, in the, uh, uh, in, the, in the record keeping, you know, the baby books. I don't know that we keep baby books anymore, but all that, you know, uh, the first time the baby went, oh, oh write it down, write it down. <laughs> and by the, by, by the time you get to the seventh or eighth kid, nah, <laughs> that's, uh, it's, that's old hat kind of stuff. But here, there's a lot of celebration. But then what I want you to notice is, uh, in verse 2, she again bare his brother Abel. Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain, he was a tiller of the ground. You can almost pick up, and maybe we're picking up stuff that's not there, but you can almost pick up that Abel 
was definitely the second child, not the first child. As a matter of fact, if we put, as we talked last week, and I won't give the uh, evidence for it again this week, but as we talked last week, if we add a few sisters in here, now he's maybe the third child, maybe the fourth child, depending on how many twins were born at, uh, that, uh, at that point. Uh, so here's Abel. Sec- well, I'm going to definitely call him the second son, but all it says is, oh, she had Abel too. She had Abel. Does anyone know? Um, my my guess is uh, my guess is no, but I tell you what. Let's see. What have I got that I haven't given away? If anyone knows, I will give away. I think I already gave you one of these, but I will give away the kingdom of the cross. What does Abel mean? That's what I thought. <laughs> the Hebrew word is, and the way it would be pronounced in Hebrew actually is chavel. Chavel. There's um, almost that H, that guttural H sound at the beginning of it. And uh, uh, probably the Hebrew would pronounce it more of a V sound than a B sound. Uh, Havel. That word is used a number of times in Scripture, and it might surprise you what it means. I'll give you one of the most... uh, familiar passages in which that word is used, and it's used a number of times. Uh, Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes says, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Would anyone like to guess what word havel means? (laughs) Vanity. Vanity, not in terms of, uh, who is the the lady bet somebody who's saying, uh, you're so vain? You probably think this song is about you. Uh, remember that is a Charlie Simon. Carly Simon, that's who that was. Um, why was I thinking like Bette Midler or something? But anyway, uh, <laughs> Carly Simon, not that kind of vain, not not vanity as in conceit, but vanity of vanities, all is vanity, is nothing worthless, empty. That's an odd thing to name your second-born son. Nothing worthless, empty. There's the possibility that, you know, language does change. There's the possibility that from the time they named him Havel to later on when Solomon said Havel, Havel, everything's Havel, that the word changed and there was a different meaning. In fact, in the sermon today, we're going to talk about one of those words that changed. So there is that possibility, but the other possibility is is Eve saying, I got enough kids. <laughs> I can't handle the ones I got. Uh, can, can, can we call in the nanny here? Uh, or some way saying, he's not, the, his, he's not his excellency Cain. This is just another boy. We see that some in the Bible. Uh, remember even David. Hey, Jesse, you got any more boys? <laughs> Just one. I mean, he's out in the field. He's nothing. (laughs) Well, bring him in. So it wouldn't be completely unusual in the Scripture to see that kind of thing. And again, I know maybe I'm reading too much into it, but I think there's often some significance in the name. And there's, there's certainly a little bit of something maybe in the fact that Abel is just barely mentioned. Even when you get Abel, you know, ah, she, she bare Abel, he was a keeper of the sheep. But Cain, <laughs> Cain is a tiller of the ground. Now, a tiller of the ground, let's call him a farmer. Uh, that is what Adam did. We're, we're told that in chapter 3 that Adam, it uses the same words, he was a tiller of the ground. So it's almost like dad and Cain they are in business together. They're in the family farming partnership. Uh, Abel, on the other hand, he is a keeper of the sheep. Now, I think, I'm, I'm, I've never been a farmer or a rancher, but I think a sheep rancher, is that what you call A shepherd, I guess is what you call him. <laughs> uh, I've never done either one. But I suspect that if you've got two brothers, one raises sheep and the other one farms, that the the one who farms does not want his brother's sheep running through the farm because I suspect he's going to eat all of the good stuff. So there's a sense in which the brother uh, who has sheep is told, 
you go out there, way out there, far out there, get your sheep out in the, in the pasture out there, uh, in, the, in the grassland out there, out on the hillsides out there, out on the ground that I can't till, that's where I want you to take your sheep. So it's a, it's a little bit of a secondary nature kind of thing that goes on here. Uh, by the way, I had an interesting thought that I've got to put together. Uh, if, if this is in the Garden of Eden, I said last week it's not a problem for Cain to be a tiller of the ground and, uh, and Abel to be a shepherd in the Garden of Eden. Uh, that's, I think, part of garden work in a sense. But then I did wonder, and maybe some of you can help me with this later on, uh, what is the purpose of raising sheep if you don't eat them, which they didn't at this time, and you don't wear clothes <laughs> in the Garden of Eden? Uh, the, the, you know, obviously raising them for the wool is something, but I, you know, I don't know, maybe they make hammocks out of it. What, what, what do you do with the wool or with the sheep? Or is there some uh, purpose? Is that how you uh, keep the grass mowed? What, what, what's, what's the purpose there? I don't know. So that's, that's a little bit of a, a wrench in the bucket there. But anyway, here it is. And this may have been a a reference after the garden anyway. But now let's get into the new stuff. I just wanted to, to uh, bring that up because we didn't last uh, week in the birth of Cain that maybe there's a, I don't know, a superiority of Cain in the family's mind. Ah, by the way, uh, let me bring up David again. Not only that experience when he was uh, left out in the field when Samuel was coming to find the next king, but uh, even... Later on, you remember from the very first sermons of the, of the life and times of King David, this, uh, in sin, my mother brought me this uh, question about David's worth and his validity, all these things that go on. So there's a little bit of, uh, I don't know, uh, similarity here anyway. So in the process of time, it came to pass. Now, that I want to, uh, I want to note that here now we are definitely talking later. By, by, by verse 3, I think, we're out of the Garden of Eden in the process of time. It came to pass. I don't know how long that is, but that doesn't seem like 10 minutes. That seems like it's days, it's weeks, it's months, it's years, who knows. Uh, but in the process of time, later on, now outside of the Garden of Eden, uh, Cain brought forth the fruit of the ground, of the fruit of the ground, an offering unto the Lord. Now, we know because uh, we've read this story before that uh, this offering is going to be a key part of the story. Uh, that's probably why it's introduced first here is, is the key part of the story. There are a number of speculations as to why his offering ultimately is not going to be received. Sometimes the speculation is, well, it's because it was not a blood sacrifice. It's just an offering out of the ground. I'm going to call it kind of a natural offering for a farmer. What is it that you bring? You don't bring your brother's sheep. You bring your own stuff. And though there's no law that we know of anyway that uh, is uh, speaking of... Um, regulations for sacrifice, this might even just be a natural thing of, hey, we're in a relationship with God. We want to honor him. We want to bring something of our own. And this is the natural thing for Cain to bring. So I don't, I, I don't really think it's because this was not a blood offering. Uh, so here he, he brings his offering. Abel also, uh, you, you know, the, even, even this, uh, right here. The worthless guy, yeah, him too, also. <laughs> Again, it's just sort of, it's very subtle, and maybe I'm reading it too much into it, but it's sort of, uh, yeah, that guy too, that guy too. So Abel also brought of the firstlings of his flock of the fat thereof. Now, obviously, this is a, uh, a, a blood sacrifice that is brought, and he brings that, and the Lord had, notice the word there, respect unto Abel and to his offering. Maybe the scenario I'm trying to paint is that maybe Abel is the first Rodney Dangerfield. You know, I don't get no respect. Uh, and 
And maybe there's nothing wrong with Cain's offering, but maybe there is something wrong with his offering. Maybe, uh, maybe there's something wrong with his heart. I think that's what we're going to find out later. But, to, but, but Abel's offering, it's a good offering. As a matter of fact, Hebrews chapter uh, 11, verse, uh, verse 4. Let me, uh, let's, let's just go ahead and read there because that does give a little bit of insight uh, into Abel's offering. Uh, remember, Hebrews chapter 11 is the, uh, what do they call it, the hall of faith. And here it says, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. So we do have to say there is something about this offering or this uh, sacrifice, as it says here, uh, something about it that is more excellent than the one Cain brought. Is it more excellent inherently, that is, in its uh, content it is more excellent? Maybe so, but the issue here is faith, and faith is not so much to do with the offering itself. It has to do more with the heart and the mind and the soul of the individual. So I, I really kind of think we're still talking about the manner, not only what he brought, but the manner in which he brought it. But he offered a, a more excellent sacrifice uh, than Cain. I think this is interesting. It says, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. Now think about that very closely as a persnickety English user. By which he obtained witness that he was righteous. Did the sacrifice make him righteous? No. The sacrifice gave testimony that he was righteous. So again, uh, whatever this difference was, one testified, you're righteous. The other testified, you got some problems, somehow. And how, what, uh, whatever, however that was, I think that's what we've got. But this is kind of interesting, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. Well, wait a minute, I heard from uh, the, re the, the reformers that uh, there's none righteous, no, not one. Excuse me, I heard that from Isaiah uh, and, uh, and Paul who repeats it. There's none righteous, no, not one. And the reformers have taken that Isaiah passage and Roman passage and said, uh, or built their doctrine of total depravity that uh, everyone who is a child of Adam has Adam's inherent guilt and is a totally depraved sinner. But here it says that Abel was righteous. And all the sacrifice did was testify that he was righteous. I don't know, one of the Calvinists might say, well, it's clear that he's one of the elect. <laughs> but I would just say, no, he was righteous. And, uh, and, and he brought this sacrifice that gave testimony that he was righteous. God testifying of, of his gifts, and uh, by it he being dead, yet speaketh. Now let's uh, head back to uh, Genesis chapter 4, verse uh, 3. Uh, so in the process of time, here we come. Abel brought of the firstlings of his flock, of the fat thereof. And the Lord, there we are again, had respect... There are other words that you could use. In, in a sense, the Hebrew word there means to, to look at. The Lord looked at his offering. It's almost the idea, and you've seen the pictures uh, before uh, in art where you've got Abel having his sacrifice and the smoke is going up and Cain has his sacrifice and the smoke's kind of blowing away. Uh, God's sort of paying attention to it. Uh, so the idea is, is uh, indeed to look at, but uh, I think there really is something to this word respect. It is a word that can mean respect in addition to look at. After all, you kind of look at that which you respect. So uh, God looks down and he has respect unto Abel and his offering. Now with that, again, so many questions there that probably we'll just have to leave to we'll never know until we get there. Uh, but, but unto Cain, the gotten one, and to his offering, he had not respect. Now here's where it gets kind of interesting. Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. It looks to me like, again, might be confirmation bias, but it looks to me like Cain is not used to being ignored. <laughs> Cain is a guy that 
when he comes in, he is the life of the party. When he comes in, um, uh, people notice. When he speaks, people listen. Uh, he is used to being the gotten one from the Lord. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Cain is in the building. And that when he gets, I don't know, overlooked, probably would be the best word. The word I want to use is slighted. God slights him a little bit. God doesn't pay attention to him. God pays attention to his runt little brother who's out there, way out there in the fields. Nobody cares about Abel. I mean, after all, he's worthless. <laughs> and God pays attention to him. Maybe God is trying to bring balance to the situation. Once again, I hate to try to pretend like I know the mind of God, but maybe, you know, if I was God, I might be saying, hey, the underdog here. God, God kind of, in the Bible, I think he sort of shows a preference for the underdog. Uh, so uh, I like, I, this, this guy over here, he's left out there. I'm, I'm, I'm going to show them. I'm going to bring him in. And may, maybe that's what's happening on God's part. But whatever is happening here, Cain certainly doesn't like it. He becomes very wroth. Wroth um, is a, uh, it's a strong, it's a, he had a temper tantrum, is, is what it is. Uh, he, he displayed his anger. His, you could see it on his face. His countenance fell. I have shifted from uh, Herbert Hoover to Richard Nixon. And uh, I'm in the early days of Nixon in, uh, in my uh, audio book. And uh, uh, Nixon was kind of a guy who, though he was not the firstborn child, he was a little bit of a, he was a little bit of the able in a lot of ways, but uh, if you just had the two to compare. But he was also one who was uh, from, the, from the early days, according to the author again, which could be total spin, but according to the author, uh, he did not like to lose. And he would uh, pout and uh, get in depression and all that kind of thing when he lost. That's probably true of most uh, politicians of that stature. But anyway, he was very wroth. His countenance fell. And, uh, and you could see it. So the Lord comes and speaks unto Cain. The Lord said unto Cain, why art thou wroth and why is thy countenance fallen? Now, let's, uh, let's, let's point up right here. And I'm going to use this. It's not strong evidence, but I'm going to use it, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, to, uh, to help say there was nothing wrong with his offering. The, what was wrong was with Cain. Why art thou wroth? Why is thou countenance fallen? says, hey, you did everything right, except it's your arrogant attitude, Cain. <laughs> uh, that, that you had no need to worry about this, except the, the manner in which you brought it or the heart with which you brought it. Uh, why art thou wroth? Why is thou countenance fallen? Again, uh, even, the, even the question here does bring about an idea or a concept. Hey, there's something you could do about this. This, this uh, does not have to be this way, which says a little bit, uh, Cain, you're not completely in the wrong. You do have a position of preeminence. You are the elder brother, after all, and we know that in Scripture the elder brother uh, often held a very uh, strong position within it. I think of uh, Reuben. You remember Reuben was the... Uh, oldest brother of Jake, uh, oldest, oldest, he was the firstborn child of uh, Jacob who became Israel. And yet he sort of uh, lost that status in Genesis chapter 49. Uh, basically, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paraphrase this, but uh, Jacob said, Reuben, you're the firstborn, and yet you are uncontrollable. <laughs> and uh, sort, of, sort of brings him down a few levels. So here we've got this issue with Cain. Why are you wroth? Why is thou countenance fallen? And then verse 7, which has uh, so much, uh, so much to, to look at here. As the Lord says, if thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? Well, it's a rhetorical question. And I think it inherently brings only one answer, and that is, yes. If I do well, I would be accepted. 
which again goes against uh, some of the, I don't know, probably uh, reformed, it's, it's become almost everywhere in evangelicalism now, but uh, one of the reformed doctrines of there is, you, you can't do well. If thou doest well, that's impossible, you're totally depraved. Uh, and whatever it is you bring isn't going to be good enough. But God here implies hey, Cain, there's just a little bit you need to change and you're going to be accepted. You're, you, you would be in the right with God if you would just, you know, get your heart right probably or get your mind right or uh, uh, get, get your... Uh, 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 well, why does that song come back to mind? Cain, you're so vain, you probably think this song is about you. <laughs> uh, if, you'd, if you'd get over that, then you would be accepted. So there's, there's something here to it. You are the older brother, just you know, uh, care for your brother. Remember later on, Cain is going to ask, am I my brother's keeper? And there's a sense in which God foreshadowing here is kind of saying, yeah, you are your brother's keeper. You happen to be the older one. There's a, there's some preeminence that comes with the older brother, but there's also some responsibility that comes. So if thou doest well, shalt thou not be ex- uh, uh, accepted. And then he flips the coin here, if thou doest not well, so he, he can do either. He can do well or he can do not well. If thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. This is it's a little bit of a poem. If, if you were to look in Hebrew poetry, verse 7 is a poem, which makes me think God must be poetic uh, because God is speaking here. So the poem is, if thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. Ah, I missed something and I gotta I gotta hit it. The word accepted, it it is a you you can translate it accepted, but it comes up uh, I don't remember, twelve or fifteen times in the uh, in the Old Testament, that Hebrew word. And this is the only time it's translated as accepted. In fact, even the King James puts a marginal note, and uh, I don't have them here on this software, by the way, but uh, I would encourage you to uh, somewhere have as a study Bible either an electronic resource or a, an actual Bible that has the marginal notes and the translator notes. There, it, it's it's a kind of an interesting uh, thing to uh, look at. We've uh, we happen to have one at dispensationalpublishing.com. Now back to the sermon. <laughs> but uh, get something that has those because there's not a lot of them. They're sparse, but they're kind of interesting. And right here is a little marginal note on the word accepted that says, or, that is, you can take accepted or you can take this. Or, here it is, are you ready for it? Have the excellency. Oh. If thou doest well, shalt thou not have the excellency? Well, Cain is wroth, the way I'm painting this picture again, Cain is wroth because his brother got something that he didn't get. His brother got the excellency, and Cain says, that's mine. I am the gotten one. Don't you know? It says right here, hello, my name is gotten. Uh, you know, I am come from the Lord. I'm the firstborn. Nobody else is like me. I am handsome. I am smart. I am a charming work of art. And Joseph in the amazing Technicolor dream coat, in case you weren't sure. I didn't just make it up. I didn't want you to think I was that handsome and smart. <laughs> but uh, so, so there, okay, Cain... You will have the excellency. Um, if, if you wanted to take the most literal translation of accepted, it would be up, uplifting, rising up. You will have the uplifting. You'll be in the spot you want if you do well. There's, there's, there's something, and, and I think, wouldn't you agree with me that when you read this and look at it in this light, you have to say, it doesn't have to do with the offering he brought. That offering was probably fine. It has to do with Cain's heart, as we would say it today. So, the first line of the poem, if thou doest well, thou shalt not be, shalt, shalt thou not be accepted. Flip that, if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. Now I'm back to where I... 
the beginning of jealousy. Oh, that's a good point, way to put that. We should have called the lesson the birth of jealousy. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think you're absolutely right. There's a, there is a jealousy. Abel seems to have handled it well. There's nothing in there that says Abel was having a pity party in the corner because he was not, you know, the, the limelight, uh, the, the uh, apple of his father's eye, so to speak. Uh, he didn't get in the family business. He's just out there. He seems to be fine with it. It's Cain when he loses, uh, loses out on that one little bit that comes from God that Cain uh, says, wait, I'm from the Lord, not him. You know, he's worthless. Uh, and so jealousy, yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. Uh, so uh, if, if, you, if you don't do well, which what you've been doing is not doing well, <laughs> if you don't do well, sin lieth at the door. Now that opens up just a whole bunch of questions, doesn't it? What sin and what door? <laughs> sin lieth at the door. There's, there's a number of ways that this has been interpreted. It is poetic. I suspect it's like almost every, every bit of poetry. There's a lot of different ways that you can go with it. In fact, I suspect uh, the best poet is able to say something that says two, three, four, five things all at once, just depending on what your frame of mind is and what you're thinking about and how you're looking at it. Have you seen that picture of the... Uh, what, what do they call the ink blot test? Uh, this is Rosh, Rosh, the that one, yes. Um, anyway, this is a it's a black and white pencil drawing. It's not an ink blot, but if, if you look at it one way, it's this beautiful young woman. If you look at it another way, it's an old hag, uh, and uh, that's good poetry there. You know, <laughs> just depending on your frame of mind, your your angle. So this is poetry. There's a number of ways you can go with it. Which one did the author mean? He doesn't really say so. He's a little bit uh, uh, hidden in it. But sin, which sin? Is it your sin? What is it? Uh, lieth at the door. So I think Rashi, I kind of under, uh, respect Rashi sometimes. Rashi uh, says, I disagree with him on he here, but Rashi says, sin lieth at the door of the grave, th of your grave. Y you're going to take this to the grave with you if you don't do well. Eh, okay, but I don't know, it seems a little contrived to me. Uh, many people, and I used to hold this one, uh, many uh, evangelicals especially, would kind of put it with, is it Peter that says uh, the devil uh, prowls about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour? And so you kind of have this idea that, hey, if you're not diligent in your well-doing, the devil is waiting just outside the door there and he's going to pounce on you as soon as you get out. There might be some truth to that. Is that what it is? that sin lieth at the door? Is he talking about Satan? is lying at the door. Uh, that, I, I'd say that's the standard evangelical approach. Again, I used to kind of hold that because I was a standard evangelical, but I don't so much anymore. Uh, Bullinger has an approach which I liked and have taught before also. Uh, you're going to say, this guy just can't land on anything. Uh, well, I can for a moment, and then later I might change my mind. <laughs> uh, Bullinger says that sin right here could be translated and understood as a sin offering. If you don't do well, there's a sin offering that lays at the door. So Bullinger gives the emphasis then on a, on a sacrifice, a different sacrifice. His, his to, to make a long story short on Bullinger, his idea is you didn't bring a sin offering. You need to bring a sin offering. There's one laying at the door right there. You could go get this and you could take care of it. Uh, the, the, he's not totally unfounded in making sin to be a sin offering because if you've got some uh, software and looked that uh, particular word up, you would find that the very word, even in that same form, is sometimes translated sin offering. So sin or a sin offering. It's the same word, so you can only go by context to determine, is this sin? Is this a sin offering? And the reason it's the same word is, is because we in English have to take, take the idea of a sin offering uh, and, and add that word to it. But their idea was 
at the altar, you literally are taking your sin and laying it on the altar through that sacrifice. So you would just call it sin. They, they, in the Hebrew mind, they didn't really call it a sin offering. They just said sin. Bring your sin and lay it on the altar. And, and we talk somewhat like that sometimes. Remember the old song, Is You're All on the Altar? It's all the words I can remember to it. But anyway, um, so he, he's not completely unfounded. The gra- grammatically it works, sin lieth at the door. Uh, but I, I kind of wonder... Could it be either your sin of, let's call it arrogance, jealousy, or could it be the ultimate sin? As a matter of fact, maybe you could say the only sin that had been committed to that point was not eating, or excuse me, was eating of the, per, the, the forbidden fruit. There was nothing else that was expressly given that this is a command of God, don't do this. So there, was, there, was, there wasn't ten commandments, there was one commandment, thou shalt not. So that was technically the only sin you could do. Like, I, I said, what, what is it, the Autobahn in Germany uh, has no speed limit? Is that, is that uh, I understand? So you can't get stopped for speeding on the Autobahn because there's no thou shalt not. Uh, now, you know, you can... Uh, I don't know, go down to Oke Winge and get a speeding ticket. Um, I don't know anything about it personally, but I met somebody once who that happened to. Uh, but anyway, you, you know, the, the, okay, there they have a sign. That's, that's, you're breaking the law if you do that. And breaking the law. <laughs> so... Uh, this, could you, could you define sin as, hey, it's the only sin that had ever taken place. The sin of, 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 let's call it the sin of Adam and Eve. That sin lieth at the door. Could we stretch it so far, and maybe it's not a stretch, to say of the Garden of Eden? In other words, that's what is blocking you from getting back in. So another way to put this is, Hey, if you do well, you'll get the excellency that you, uh, you desire and you deserve. But if you don't do well, there's really no way back in. There, I mean, that's, that's really your only choice. You can do well or not. This is dispensationally, we call this the dispensation of conscience. The dispensation of conscience is you do what's right. That's, that's all there was to it. It's kind of a libertarian dispensation. Do what's right. It's, uh, it's up to you. You go and do what's right. So the Lord really kind of comes and says, Hey, Cain, if you do what's right, uh, you, you, you'll be accepted. If you don't, there's no other option. That, that's all there is to it. Sin, sin is blocking the door. The sin of Adam and Eve is blocking the door. Uh, now, let's, uh, let's move on and finish this uh, verse 7 here and stop. Unto thee shall be his desire. What's kind of interesting here, let me see if I can uh, make a, I'm going to make that, uh, I don't have pink, so I'm going to go red. Uh, and there, let's go blue. There we go. Uh, that's pink and that's blue. If we're talking grammatically, sin is a feminine noun. Whereas his, obviously, is a masculine pronoun. So, sin lieth at the door, and his desire shall be for you. That doesn't sound like the sin offering, his, doesn't completely sound like they go together. Now, maybe the sin offering is a male lamb, and so put that together if you're, if you're reading Bollinger. But just reading in context, as you go through this little poem right here, uh, what if we go back, if thou doest well, shall, should, you'll receive the excellence. Unto thee shall be his desire, thou shalt rule over him. 
if you take the word excellence, which is the way it basically is uh, pronounced everywhere else or translated everywhere else, who does his desire and him become? Abel. Cain, O-gotten one. If I just needed to give you this kick in the pants. Now, if you'll straighten up and act like a good big brother, then you will receive the excellency. You will be lifted up. You will be accepted. And the one over there, Abel, the worthless one, his desire will be for you, and you will rule over him. What, that, that's, that's the way I'm going to take this. And, and then, let, let me, uh, let's, let's take this little phrase right here. Unto thee shall, shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Does that half ring a bell? if you've only read Genesis 1 through 4, 1 through 4, 7. There's actually an echo. That's an echo of something we've had earlier. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, God said to Eve, unto him shall be your desire, and he shall rule over thee. Very close. It, it flips the flips the script a little bit, but it certainly would have to echo of that. Now, if you're reading the Bible and, tr and trying to do it in context, Genesis 3.16 is very much in context. So this is the, the, the few things that they know here, uh, is that this comes very closely. Now to Eve, and this was a matter of uh, putting some, what do you call it, uh, rank, hierarchy, structure, social structure. And God says, hey, now that you're out of the garden, Eve, unto him shall be your desire, speaking of Adam, and he will rule over you. Let's just summarize that to say the husband is the head of the home. And I've talked about that before. My understanding of why that, uh, that instruction was given, not, was, not because women are uh, less capable or to demean women, but just because uh, in the fallen world, if we don't have some kind of structure, we're going to kill each other. <laughs> so somebody's got to, you know, in, in, a, in a marriage of two, you can end up with a tie very often, right? <laughs> so uh, what are we going to do? Okay, he shall rule over thee. Well, here, if you take that, if, if Cain, if you're the proper older brother, then Abel is going to look up to you, he's going to respect you, and you will rule over him. You'll have the excellency. Almost as saying, hey, there is, some, there is some structure, the structure of the elders, I don't know, something like this that God is uh, putting in. And, uh, and taking through. Now, I, all of that to say, and I'm out of time, all that to say, that's a very kind of different take on this whole Cain and Abel story that maybe the issue is Cain is too arrogant. And when God didn't uh, come and kiss Cain's big toe, then uh, Cain became very wroth, depressed, didn't know what to do with himself. And, uh, you know, start acting like a, I don't know, a three-year-old or something like this. And God says, hey, Cain, what would, what would you say if you, had, if you had two brothers in the house and, uh, you know, the, the younger brother gets to play with the toy for a little bit? Uh, and uh, the, the big brother, I mean, I know this is a very odd scenario, it would never happen, but the big brother, you know, uh, has, has his pity party because, of, you know, it's my toy, <laughs> whatever it is. Uh, and you would say, hey, calm down, you're going to get your turn, and you got to treat your brother nice, and you got to share. That's almost what this story is about, it looks like to me. And, and, and God says, look, Cain, all you got to do is act like a decent human being. <laughs> And you got the position of excellency. It's, it's yours. And your brother will look up to you. But you, 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 you can't just have a pity party every time your brother gets to play with the toys. Jealousy. The birth of jealousy. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it, Jeannie. Uh, 
So unto thee shall be his desire. I got. I'm stopping right here. But next, stopping right here. But next week, uh, Cain talked with his Abel, his brother. Uh, I might put the verse number right there, uh, and say, "Hey, maybe Cain sort of got it. Uh, he he went and he talked to his brother." I can kind of picture it as Abel saying, "Excuse me, Cain saying, hey, I." Uh, kind of blew my top when God honored you instead of me. He respected you instead of me. And I realize now I've been kind of putting you out to pasture. My bad. Everything good. But that's not the end of the story. As you know, <laughs> but we'll pick up on it next week. And next week we're actually going to see, you know, when uh, uh, Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. Is it premeditated murder or is it, uh, what do you call it? when it's not premeditated murder. First degree is premeditated. Second degree? Second degree, manslaughter. Manslaughter. Is it murder or is it manslaughter? That's the question for next week. <laughs> We're going to uh, stop and see there. And uh, so uh, that, uh, let's see uh, here. Uh, let's, uh, where are we? There. Now we look professional. I'll, I'll lead us in a word of prayer, and we'll break so we can uh, get ready for worship. Heavenly Father, thanks for uh, the little Bible study we've had this morning, the uh, goodness of your, uh, your word and your presence. We ask that you encourage us in our worship time here in just a few moments. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Let's take a five-minute break or so, and we'll get started.